My name is John Parker Hammond. I was born on March 14, 1928. What follows is a record of certain events in which I took part between the years 1980 and 1997 on an island I will call Site B. Site B was not to be a theme park, but a research station. This was where we did the real work. By 1989, international genetic technologies had succeeded in their design to genetically recreate the dinosaurs. It was an unprecedented accomplishment, the pinnacle of 20th century science, a work to rank with the achievements of Galileo or Einstein. But it was not all so easy or so simple as it appeared. And seldom hears the true history of such events. What happened at the place where the world changed? How it began? What were the reasons? What was the cost? A Nobel Prize or a financial empire waits somewhere in a darkened room, in a dirty, derelict building, somewhere in the Pacific. It was the flowering of an ambition born 50 years ago. 50 years struggle come to this. When I was little, I dreamed of a time when the entire world was covered by an ancient forest. Great hunters stalked in the cool darkness among silent, huge columna trees, oaks and sequoias. I, I left home at 15 with a rather romantic idea of seeking my fortune. I remember, I remember the train ride south in my best clothes, eating an apple. The entire world before me. When I came to London, I had neither fortune, nor education, nor connections. Nothing. The mysterious John Hammond, shady investor, multimillionaire, <laughs> jovial mad scientist. An idea brought me awake one morning in New York. I almost didn't write it down. What if a mosquito sucked the blood of a dinosaur 100 million years ago? The insect is then covered in tree sap which over the millennia, becomes amber. The insect is preserved perfectly. But you see, and here's the clever part, wouldn't the dinosaur blood be preserved as well? The blood holds DNA a tiny spiral of genetic code. Abracadabra. Mm -hmm. 
sunlight angled down through the dusty air in Norman's office and I leaned against a solid oak table as I outlined my plans for international genetic technologies. The first task was genetic recovery. Acquiring Jurassic or Cretaceous amber, extracting preserved DNA and reassembling the complete sequences. Bringing it up the well, we called it. I spared no expense, permitted no failures. If we succeeded, the InGen technology would be historic. We were planning to conquer time's power over life, its power to extinguish and erase. It would change all our lives as profoundly, as irrevocably, as the atomic bomb. Isla Sol. Costa Rica lay to the east, a quiet neighbor, to the west, open water, and the shipping lanes of the Pacific. Nineteen eighty one. I stumbled out of the helicopter, already beginning to sweat, and looked around at the lush forest, the wet leaves. A forest this wild, this unknown, has not been seen by any human since the great hunters of the early Pliocene. The forest smelled of wet leaves, damp earth, rotting wood. Cameras and seismic instruments in yellow crates. They set them in the dust as the helicopter rose. A few weeks after we landed, we went to the summit to put up a crude satellite link. We went by helicopter. Young technicians scrambled to set up the dish as the wind howled. High speed uplink. <laughs> State of the art. In May the rains came. The smell of the jungle was everywhere. The jungle canopy hung over us. There was an utter silence. Far away I could hear a jeep engine idling. Ingen standard safari vehicle. State of the art. As I journeyed south along the coast, the air grew moist and heavy. Metal and concrete lay rotting in the sun and the rain. A failed coffee plantation of the 1860s. Fields were marked out by stone walls. And to the west, the ruins of the plantation house still stand. The buildings followed a scheme I only vaguely understood, marking seasons and the lunar year and the movement of the stars. The sky at noon was like nothing in Europe. Hot, tropical and new world. On the plain, the heat was extraordinary, like a solid wall. I stepped out of the jeep and stretched my legs. The two guards attended to the wheel, and just for an instant, I stood alone, unprotected in the Jurassic wilderness. I felt the air currents around me, heard a single tree rustle. Nineteen eighty-two. Robert Muldoon I already knew. 
Dennis Nedry I found in Cambridge. And despite his idiosyncrasies, he was years ahead of his competition. Dennis fancied himself quite the hacker. He had his own locks for his doors. His office decorations were quite outside company regulations. Henry Wu was an only child from Ohio, a prodigy. He gained early attention for his undergraduate thesis at MIT. Dr. Wu's laboratory was a mystery to me. I never finished my schooling. I had a child's idea of science, test tubes, explosions, <laughs> and miracles. The main laboratory and administrative buildings, this was where we made our discovery, where the real magic trick happened. When they come to dig up our secrets, they'll come here. It was strange to move from the field, the hot sun, dirt on one's trouser cuffs, into the cool, sterile darkness of the lab. The sharp tang of the preservative chemicals, the coolness and hush of the sterile chamber, the daily ritual of decontamination. The centrifuge word night and day, the slow alchemy of genetic replication. The clear fluid held a cloudy layer of DNA strands. We worked long into the night, feeling at times as if the whole of the earth had fallen away outside, leaving only the darkness, the work, the endless questioning into the past. Keyboards rattled into the early morning. Ranks of green CRT screens displayed collated genetic data. Three Cray XMPs move more data faster than any computer center in the Americas. Site B was fully centralized and computer controlled. The same design that became the Achilles heel of Jurassic Park. Diagnostics, communications, security, all ran through the computer. Accordingly, computer security was paramount the tightest on the island. Two German technicians were accused of conspiring to walk out with crucial research materials. They planned to breach the main computer vault and remove some of the data stored there. No proof was ever found. It was in the last days of genetic recovery, and at this point nothing was certain. Was the DNA there? Could we bring it back? Up the well? In a quiet, locked room, the extinction of species, the history of life on Earth, is being methodically reversed. It was 3 a.m. The room was strewn with soda cans, and for the hundredth time, we ran the extraction sequence. As Ned retyped, the world seemed to hold its breath, and for a moment we stood at the turning point between two great planetary eras, the million-year reign of man and the age of the dinosaurs. Dennis, what are we looking at here? All my life I'd waited for something great something extraordinary and then it opened up the cold red true the barrier of time for for an instant opened nature and i stared into the monitor straight back through 65,000 centuries i became
began to have my first inkling of the seriousness of our work, how deep the well was. This was life from 65 or 100 million years before mankind. The greatest discovery of the 20th century. Building the town was hard. Costa Rican contractors were competent people, but they had to be transported, fed, housed, and afterwards bound to silence. The biotechnicians were compensated for living in exile, high pay, luxury housing. Dennis wanted computer time and money. Henry wanted his state-of-the-art entertainments. These were the elite who could have gone anywhere to work. I had to keep them here. Left to itself, the facility reverts to minimal power, chiefly battery-powered security systems. It can sustain itself almost indefinitely. A passcode let us control access to the valley and the power station beyond. In 11 months, Site B became the most powerful genetics facility in the world. We were neither the only covert business to thrive in Central America nor the most dangerous. In 1983, we held 13 new patents. November 1983, test fertilization of an artificial ovum. My hand shook as I held the tiny eyedropper. One drop, two drops. There, the genie was out of the bottle. The raptor took shape inside its egg and I watched it on the ultrasound monitor. It looked like a ghost or a puff of smoke. Not all the original species survived. In the end, only a few adjusted to the new world. These became dominant. Brachiosaur, oldest of our recreations by 50 million years, the only true Jurassic native. One of the largest creatures ever to live. The Brachiosaur moved like planets among the smaller species. Tyrannosaurus Rex, tyrant lizard. They reigned for 25 million years. We, we grew seven of them, the seven rulers of the island. And despite what we've been led to believe, the T-Rex was not a scavenger at all. We clocked one at 50 kilometers an hour. Ceratops, with the Tyrannosaur, one of the last dinosaurs to live naturally on our planet. Alone, fast and strong, 
eking out a living between the seven Tyrannosaur and the three Raptor tribes. The Albertosaurs took to the open fields like lions to the Serengeti. Velociraptor, a small theropod native to China and Mongolia. Pack hunter, quite vicious and quite intelligent. We released the first raptor on April 22nd, 1985. It wandered back and forth near the wall for four minutes and 22 seconds before hearing a noise which drew it further off into the brush. The raptor padded in towards sundown. It drank nervously, careful of the dangers of the Jurassic water hole. The raptor preened itself utterly confident of its right to be there, absolutely no consciousness that it was not the sovereign ruler of this earth. For four months we'd monitored it while it preyed on herds in the southern forest. We never knew why it grew so large. In the summer of 1988, it began moving north. In the jungle, the forest and the mountain, three raptor tribes staked out territory. Albertosaurs and seven T-Rex chose their dominions. Uneasy borders drawn around forest, ridges and ponds. A third tribe of raptors took the mountain for their territory, a leaner, tougher breed. Quick, living on birds and tiny lizards. We tagged the most dangerous animals with radio collars that transmitted a warning signal and workmen carried little boxes that played a tone when a tagged animal came near, at which point they would panic and flee in terror. By 1987, the first of them had reached full size. The ecosystem of another era began to reassert itself. In 1988, workers from the mainland were pouring concrete supports for a rail system running north to the settlement. In the winter, we began building the supports for the elevated transit system that would unify the island. Concrete towers rose through the jungle canopy. The pylons ran for kilometers, one every hundred meters or so. I built them to last. Running east from the plant, they climbed the valley before descending south into the plains. Curving up out of the southern basin, the Atherton Causeway would bring visiting scientists north from the southern beach. In gen reception, I planned that someday visitors, scientists and politicians would be welcome here. May 1989, we began laying foundations on the South Beach for a hotel for visiting scientists and businessmen. A year hence, I thought, the island would be quite famous. The southern beach looked out over Tractus Ocean, down past Peru all the way to Antarctica. The main harbor for Site B.
The docks were the lifeblood of Site B. Amber, synthetic eggshell and livestock came from all over the Pacific Rim. Chinese sailors singing in a curious, keening falsetto as they unloaded the synthetic polymer eggs. The smells of salt water and gasoline. The steam pipes hissed and spat. Water pumped deep into the earth and came back superheated. The Emily was a tug for bringing in the bigger freighters. Occasionally we took it out to observe specimens from offshore or to sweep the tide for traces of our operation. It was scuttled in 1989 as a quarantine measure soon after I gave the government my testimony. Far out to sea, we would sometimes glimpse the U.S. Coast Guard units assigned to observe our activity. In 1989, the park was nearly complete. Our investors demanded on-site approval, and I, idiotically as it now turned out, believed we were ready. The debacle of August 27th, 1989, is now quite well known and the legal consequences were, as you may well imagine, uh, rather extensive. I still believe Nedry left himself a back door, something about the hobbits or God knows what. On October the 3rd, 1989, I sat on a wooden bench in the waiting room in Washington, D.C. A government panel put me on the stand. As my name was read out, the session room went silent. They walked up the aisle towards the stand. I was being called to account, but I had no clear explanation to give. I'm sure you've heard the rest of the story on the television news or in the tabloids. Bankruptcy. I leaned against the wall, my whole body shook. I dropped the mug, it shattered. I let it lie there. We would be leaving soon. When it became known that I was bankrupt, workers simply dropped their tools and walked away. As we left, we vandalized our own locking mechanisms. InGen tolerates no trespasses. Buildings were stripped of everything valuable. Technicians and workmen crowded round the docks, fearing they might be left behind when the security ring collapsed. Armed guards stood watch. Picture them moving cautiously through the dusty rooms in bulky biohazard gear, clutching rifles, poring over our records, reading our files. And we sealed off the town, save for a few crucial gates, southward to the Lowlands, eastward to the power plant and laboratory. We sealed the eastern gate for the last time. Gazing from my study window, I hit on a simple mnemonic for the passcode. Like Nedry, I felt I needed to keep a back door open. I gave myself over to the strange, lonely discipline of the market. Investment strategies and profit. I stood apart. Master of codes and lost worlds of heat and cold and the sleep of a hundred million years. A lost world is a sort of scientific myth, an evolutionary scenario in which an ecosystem is isolated and preserved, 
The rest of the world changes, leaving a tiny, fragile pocket where ancient species survive. October 1996. The InGen Corporation is taken out of my hands by a vote of the Board of Directors. My nephew dispatches his team. The hunters landed on May 13, 1997, deep in the island's southwest. Most of them had worked at my African parks for years. They never stood a chance. Hunting dinosaurs is quite a tricky business. I recommend helicopters, if you've got them. The Instrat guns, by the way, Swedish made, unbeatable for accuracy and rate of fire. American made tranquilizer darts. The effect changes with the target's body mass, temperament, and mood. I believe the phrase is, results may vary. The Engine hunting party carried the passcodes for our perimeter fences. Hunters scattered, their prearranged hunting routes forgotten. Only a third of their number appeared at the rendezvous. Martin A.S. Still missing. Adam Chetty V. Still missing. Sullivan R.M. Still missing. Vassal P. Still missing. Van Horn S.T. Also. Still missing. Mistrata A.L. Deceased. I was unable to find any records whatsoever on Michael Sullivan beyond the sole fact that his flight to the rendezvous originated in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. La Salle was a disciple of Roland's, a sometime poacher, fancied himself a master hunter. An ex-policeman from South Africa, a sort of uh, soldier of fortune character, known as the Maharaja to his fellows, highly skilled, but only works alone. He was meant to radio for picking up from the comm station. I first met Harold Greenwood in 1992. He was uh, an American, introduced to me as a former Green Beret. He asked a number of questions about the disposition of the InGen technology. Harry claimed to be a friend of my former son-in-law. I liked him. He was confident and dashing. Greenwood carried some sort of electronic device, which we're told he built himself, based on plans that he found on the internet. My work, my work lies where I left it. If there is anyone brave enough and clever enough to take it and return the keys to time, perhaps the foundation of a new empire. As I write this, tiles are cracking, smeared with windblown dirt and animal tracks. Thick tree roots are pushing up through the asphalt. The island settles itself, beginning to erase all trace of us. Water seeped into everything. The technology, the real trick of it, is still in there. In a darkened room, in an empty building with a dirty floor, it waits. The flashpoint, the origin of Jurassic Park. Creation is an act of sheer will. 
but next time it'll be flawless. On that last day I stood apart from the rest of them. The helicopters were setting down. Before me the jungle spread out and I saw that a savage primal age had begun again. Some of my personal papers had been transferred to Disket. Lord Darley's charity luncheon, a society event, £200 a ticket, a bit of a step up for me socially. I was seated with this very pleasant young woman. I, I would gaze at her dinner parties in moments when she was distracted. The hair on her upper lip, the way she exhaled the smoke from her cigarette. Save that in her voice and her walk there was a world of grace and sophistication that I knew I was forever barred from. She would not answer me at first. I asked her again. Partigoers glanced curiously in my direction. Candlelight blurred my vision. I, uh, I, I stammered it. I was not certain what I should say. She, she laughed, though, and seemed charmed. Uh, she asked me to call again tomorrow. 2 a.m. I called once again. She had still not come home, nor did they know where she was. I, I didn't leave my name. I'll never forget this, and I will never forgive, I swear it, this is the last time. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert, near them on the sand Half sunk a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear, my name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. <laughs>